Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. Hello, River family. Welcome to our broadcast, second Sunday of November. So glad that you're with us, whether you are in another state, another country, or right here in Abilene, kind of staying home, being careful. We are thrilled that you joined us, and we just pray that you encounter the Lord today. Know that you're still part of our family, even though maybe we don't see you in person, you're still a part of our family. If you ever need anything, please email us, uh, prayer requests, anything to office at the river Abilene.com. We'd be happy uh, to be praying for you and, and, and see if we can help meet any needs. But let me tell you, first of all, a few things that are going on in the life of the church. Uh, first of all, no, uh, here live every week we have some pretty strong COVID protocols. We clean our nursery toys twice a week. Uh, everything is um, well sanitized. And praise God the numbers are going down. Uh, but just, just know that we, we try to be as careful as possible here at the river. This was the last week uh, of groups, uh, so we're going to have not groups this coming Wednesday, but Rivers Giving. Let's talk about Rivers Giving. Rivers Giving is when the people of God know that God in His infinite grace suspends all calories and fat, and we strap on the feed bag in fellowship and celebration. We have turkey and ham and pies and cakes and cookies and all sorts of great stuff, you are invited. If you're like, man, I'd, I'd like to step back in and be back in church again, come on. Just come on. Wednesday, 6.15, this coming Wednesday, it's going to be a lot of fun. Our children's area has grown uh, substantially, and we are continuing to look for people who maybe can volunteer once a month to help out back there. Um, if you are interested in that, you feel some call to be with our children, uh, there's, you, can, you can help out on Wednesdays or you could help out on Sundays. Uh, we'd love to know that. Once again, you can go to the office, or not the office, office at theriverabilene.com and uh, let us know that you have interest in that. Uh, today, uh, this Sunday, we're having our Team River class. I had to push it a week because I, our, our first grandchild was born, but um, the Team River class is a class where you're introduced to us as the spiritual leaders and also to the ministries and the vision of the church and where you can kind of make a commitment that the river is your home church. The next class is December the 5th. This class is full. December the 5th is filling up very fast. So if you're interested in being a part of that, once again, uh, for online community, you can just uh, email us at officetheriveraveline.com. That's the third time I've said that, so you should know that very email. Also, next Sunday uh, will likely be at least one, maybe two baptisms. If you are interested in exploring baptism, please give me a call here at the church. Um, email me, Pastor David at theriverabilene.com, and I would love to talk with you about that particular subject and what, the, what it means. So just know that we'd love for you to be a part of that. <clears throat> also, uh, each week um, we have a great opportunity to worship the Lord in a sort of a, a physical way, and that is by giving. And you can give uh, into the ministries of the river uh, by uh, snail mail at 539 U.S. Highway 83, Abilene, Texas 79602. Or you can go and give by secure text at 84321 via your phone. Or you can give uh, at theriverabilene.com. Uh, go to the pull down and then you can give securely there. All that is more than just sort of operational running things or supporting specific ministries. That is our act of, of worship. 
And so I want to encourage you, if the Lord is asking you to, to give, it is your moment to shine and let Him know how much you love Him. So here's a, uh, an interesting question. So um, uh, magazines come up with this every year. Um, who are the most attractive male and female most attractive man on the planet, most attractive woman on the planet, according to some major uh, uh, publications. Who are they for 2021? Talk amongst yourselves or ask yourself a question if you're alone, okay? We'll see you in just a bit. So worthy, and worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. So Jesus, the name above every name. Jesus. Holy day. 
trust the Lord this morning. I think some of us have, have professed God as our King, Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but sometimes we struggle to trust Him, trust Him with our kids. Have you struggled to trust God with your children? Have you struggled to trust God with your job, with your employment? With your finances? What about your marriage? What about school? Come on. This morning I'm here to tell you that you can trust God. You can put your trust in Him. He is your firm foundation. He will not be shaken. Come on, sing this. I will build my life.
Church, tell the person next to you that there is none like him. You know what? No more excuses. I will willingly choose God's fame above my own. I will stop acting as if I am the center of the world. I will look at my apathy straight in the face and demand that it leave. No more excuses. I will both admit my addictions and cry out to the healer. I will refuse to allow the enemy to continue stealing my joy. I will stop worrying about what everyone around me is thinking. No more excuses. I will turn my heart back again. I will listen hard to the whispers of his spirit and I will proclaim the wonders of his never ending love. No more excuses. No games, no pretending, no hiding, no dead religion. No more excuses, period. Logan River family, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining again today. So here's some crazy answers. Um, sexiest woman alive is a woman named Tayana Taylor. Now, I don't know her, but apparently she's a, a dancer and a director and a mother to two. Apparently she's an amazing person. Um, and, then, and then get this, the, the, the most attractive or sexiest man alive is Paul Rudd, Ant-Man. I don't know. I don't make the rules. We love attractiveness. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But let me get back on to what we um, have been talking about the last few weeks. And that is the title of the sermon series is called Excuse Me, not Excuse Me, Excuse Me. Everybody has an excuse for not stepping out in obedience, for not stepping into uh, kingdom involvement as a Christian. We all have uh, those moments where we have a beautiful, well-written, wonderfully semi-spiritual excuse that keeps us from really stepping out and doing what God would have us do. And it keeps the body of Christ sort of observing, consuming, and critiquing as though we've gone to a movie each week. When in fact, I believe God has called us to a, a, a greater greater possibility and that is that we step out and the body of Christ is mobilized and the body of Christ grows because the body of Christ is mobilized to kingdom business. But we all have an excuse and we, and we like them. We really like them. This kind of reminds me of this older gentleman. He had stacked up some money and, and he went in and he bought a Ferrari, beautiful red Ferrari. And he, He's out just whirling around with his Ferrari and he's, he's getting after it. And at one point he looks down, he's doing 120. And all of a sudden he sees the lights and there's a cop behind him. So he thinks to himself, I can outrun this cop. And so he gets up to about 150 and then he says, he remembers his age and he's like, I'm, I'm too old for this. So he pulls over, the cop pulls up and the cop walks up and says, listen, mister. He said, I'm 10 minutes away from the end of my shift. If you can tell me an excuse that I've never heard before, I will let you go. Well, the man said, okay. He said, well, let me tell you what happened. Several years ago, my wife ran off with a police officer. And I thought you were trying to catch up and bring her back. The police officer said, have a good day. Turned around and walked away. We all have excuses. Now, here's the thing. In the body of Christ, either we condemn or we don't pay attention to. So we condemn the excuses of others and we kind of don't pay attention to the enormity of our own. But what if we, what if we spoke to those excuses, eliminating them, so that we become mobilized and the kingdom of God is advanced. We're going to learn
learn a little bit more about that in just a minute. Let's go to the Lord first. Lord, I thank you for this uh, intrinsic, amazing opportunity that the Word of God gives us to uh, mess with our souls, to overwhelm us, and to allow us a freedom to actually become who we are called to be. So Lord, I pray that you would forgive us of our excuses. And Lord, that you give us the guts to speak to them, to eliminate them, and to align our hearts with yours. And I pray that the, the kingdom of God would come, the kingdom of God would reign around each of us because we would no longer be those who sit, consume, and critique. But that we would become the body of Christ, mobilized. And Lord, as for me, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase and be our preacher and teacher today. And all the people said, Amen. Say Amen to somebody. All right. If you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to go to 1 Samuel. It's in the Old Testament. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let me give you a, a bit of a backstory. So what's happened is Israel has decided that they want to have a king like everybody else. Now, God said, well, pretty much I'm your king. You don't need a king. But they're like, no, 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 we want to be like everybody else. So they chose Saul. Saul is a handsome devil. He is a full head taller than everybody else. He is chiseled. Everybody looked at him and said, that's our guy right there. Samuel, the priest who's in charge of the, the spiritual life and is the kingmaker by the hand of God, says, okay, Saul, Saul's the guy. Well, Saul begins to have some success and gets kind of popular. And all of a sudden, Saul gets full of Saul. And at one point, Saul and Samuel have a strong disagreement because Saul has fully disobeyed God. And Samuel has called him out on it. And then God tells Samuel, you tell him I've rejected him as king. Can you imagine that? It's a very powerful king. Samuel tells Saul he's been rejected as king. Samuel is heartbroken because the king that he anointed is no longer God's choice. And Samuel sent away. And after he goes away, God says, I want you to anoint a new king. And we're going to talk about perceptions. So in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, starting in verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? He's still really hurting. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be the king. Now, here's the interesting thing. That horn of, of oil, or if you're from Texas, oil, that, that oil, that's the anointing. That's what they're going to use to anoint. And that's symbolic of, 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 of position, but it's also symbolic of the Spirit of God is now upon this person to fulfill a certain task. So he's sending him five miles south to a family he doesn't know, to some random somebody that he has never seen before to anoint him as king of all of Israel. Sounds a little bizarre, doesn't it? But that's how God works sometimes. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me, which he probably would have. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse, this is the dad, to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So that's what he does. So God gives a little grace to not lie, but to um, give a semi-truth, if you will. I'm going to sacrifice, which he absolutely was, but it was going to protect him from Saul. Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived in Bethlehem, remember five uh, a mile south, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Now, here's the interesting thing. The elders are probably scared because they think that Samuel may be coming to rally them against Saul. They're not interested in that. Saul's got big armies. Or that him just being there could potentially have Saul come down and wipe some people out. So they are not comfortable. The elders are the leaders of the city. They go to the gates. They have meetings. These are important spiritual and, and uh, economic leaders of the community. 
Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself. That means make yourself right and be prepared and come to the sacrifice uh, uh, come to, to the sacrifice. And I invited, he invited the, the whole crew of elders to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse, so he must have been one of the elders, and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. So he knew this guy, Jesse, was the guy he was supposed to talk to. And so you have a, a crowd of elders and Jesse and his sons. He spent time with them, and now it's time to do the sacrifice and to do the anointing. Watch what happens. But when he arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, Eliab, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me. Surely that's the guy. Now, now, think about this for a minute. Samuel, who already knows rugged, handsome, tall guys are not necessarily who God's going to call because he called Saul and Saul's a mess. Is looking at a tall, rugged, handsome guy named Eliab and going, oh, that's got to be the dude. That's the guy that's going to do the stuff. Yeah, imagine there's an attractiveness that we assign importance to sometimes. There's a preset in our brain that we assign importance to. Let, let's just do a little exercise. Let's say that you're in a small group in school. And, and, and there's, there's maybe 10 people in the small group. And you have to elect a leader. And in that small group is this guy. All of a sudden, all the ladies got more interested. Do you think he might get elected? attractive or maybe maybe in your small group is this guy you think he might be elected to lead the group or maybe maybe there's this guy do you think he'd be elected to lead the group or maybe maybe there's that dude there's a lot of Chris's in there you think if they say, well, let's vote on who's going to lead us, that everybody just maybe go, well, I, I, him? He, he looks good. Or maybe it's that dude. Because he could lead and sing and dance. Or maybe, maybe, maybe it's that dude. You see, we have this preset of who we think would be the right person to accomplish major tasks. And there's this weird attachment to an exterior preset that we assign as someone of importance. You see, you have one. I have one. Pretty much all Christians have one. Of what someone should look like, whether that be appearance or operational that can really be used of God. And I bet we already think that we are not that. You see, each of us has our own Eliab. And our excuse ends up being, I'm not like Eliab. I love God. I give. I care. But I'm not Eliab. Each of us has someone in our preset, in our memory, in our thoughts that is a great, spiritual, loving, amazing, powerful Christian person. And immediately we carve ourselves out of that preset category of spiritual Christian attractiveness. Who is your Eliab? Maybe there's a, a strong person, maybe your grandmother strong Christian, you're like, man, I love God, but I'm not her. Maybe there's a, a, a famous uh, a person on TV, a strong Christian preacher, and you're like, well, I, I love God, but I'm not him. We have an infatuation with a preset that is attractive, either operationally or visually, 
that we think we don't fall into the category of. And it gives us this great excuse. You know, I love God, but I'm not Mother Teresa. It's our Eliab. And it keeps us from stepping out because we have a great excuse. We're not quite that. We're not quite as spiritually attractive as that. Now watch what happens. God begins to scold Samuel. <laughs> and the tenor of the whole passage is kind of a scolding. He says this, that he saw Eliab and he said, Surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. He's a tall dude. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So they continue the succession. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. So Shema came in front of him. He didn't choose him either. Jesse had all seven of his sons come before him. The Lord has not chosen these. So, so he asked Jesse, are all these sons, are these all the sons that you have? He said, well, they're still the youngest one. He's tending sheep. <laughs> he ain't the sacrifice. He's doing the worst job. He's a nobody. Out in the field, somewhere between 10 and 15 years of age, smelling like sheep, playing his harp, trying to keep um, lions and stuff from eating the lambs. That's that dude. You see, whenever you're sent out to take care of the sheep, it means you're the youngest and they don't really care that much about you. You're doing the crummy job. And so what's what Samuel says? <laughs> They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We're not even going to sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and he had him brought in. Now watch this description. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Let, let me unpack that because it's a little bit of an awkward translation. A lot of the older translations said that he was ruddy and handsome and had great eyes. Ruddy is um, a word, adonomai, which actually means red. And so listen to this. We have that attached also to Esau in the scripture. David is likely red-headed. Now here's the funny thing. People in the Middle East are not red-headed. It is super, super rare. David is a kid. He's short because he's a kid and he's red-headed. Whereas in, in all of the scripture, we find in all the culture that long black mane is seen as beautiful. And if you're bald, you're made fun of. Things don't change. And David is red-headed. And it says that his visage, really, his eyes and his face had an attractiveness to them that were not the attractiveness of Eliab. It was the attractiveness of something from within. The text actually gives us this picture that there's something spiritual about his visage that is making him attractive. A nasty, nobody, youngest Short kid with red hair that doesn't even fit in with the rest of the culture is the guy that God picks. So the craziest thing is, see, God didn't choose the Eliab, the beautifully chiseled, amazing leader looking guy. He chose Opie. Not exactly who you would think would become the next king of Israel. A no-name, red-headed, really different. He had this fine appearance and he was handsome. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is the one. 
So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of God came pow powerfully upon David. Samuel then went back, he went back home to Ramah. Interesting thing. David may have had these thoughts, but can you imagine if he voiced them? If he thought, me, you're anointing me? Have you seen my brother Eliab? Like that dude cut. I'm redheaded. I'm a kid. I am not, listen closely, Eliab. How can I serve? How can I be anointed? How can I be the guy that actually does kingdom business, that leads the people of God when I'm not Eliab? How do I do that? And yet that's the person that God chooses. You see, we have an, an infatuation and a nostalgia for people that we see as spiritual giants. And so we attach this sentence to, I love God, but I'm not Eliab. Fill in the blank. I'm not that guy. I'm not that gal. And one of the greatest ways that we can become productive in the kingdom of God is to accept the anointing in absentia of our Eliab. God's not called you to be Eliab. Eliab is Eliab. God's not called you to be Billy Graham. Billy Graham was Billy Graham. God's not called you to be Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was Mother Teresa. God's not called you to be this great leader that, that, that we have assigned this attractiveness to, that we've been drawn to because they're so amazing and they have a certain way of operating that makes them so attractive and so wonderful. And so we elevate them to the point by their appearance spiritually that we excuse ourselves from being activated for the kingdom because we are not them. Who's your Eliab? Who is your Eliab? What is your Eliab? Can you imagine if David said, oh, thank you, Samuel, but I'm not Eliab. I just came from the sheep. I'm smelly. I'm stinky. I'm a kid. I'm short. This may look all right, but I got red hair. I don't even fit in. But he didn't. He accepted the anointing anyway. Beloved, instead of condemning ourselves for the excuse of elevating someone, of creating a, a thought of the attractive preset that we have in our mind of a great Christian follower of Jesus, someone greatly effective for the kingdom, instead of letting that rule our lives, I believe we are called to be the one that God anoints. We're not that person. Why would we compare ourselves to that person unless we're looking for a way out from the great things that God would call us to? And our enemy, our enemy uses that, brings it to the forefront to keep us inactive in the kingdom, allows us to sit, consume, and critique and not mobilize to be a great leader of God, not mobilize to take the gospel out, not mobilize to do kingdom business. Who's your Eliab? It says that David was a man after God's own heart. Let me give you something to think about. Instead of being angry that you keep saying, well, I would love to do something for the Lord. I'd love to step out. I'd love to have faith. I'd love to pray over somebody. I'd love to, to leave my neighbor. I'd love to do all these sort of things, but I am not Eliab. What if you just release that? Identify your Eliab and realize that's not who you are. God called the stinky redhead teenager to lead the nation of Israel. 
not the attractive, high leader quality, perfect guy. You see, it wasn't Chris Hemsworth, it was Opie. So we really don't have excuses. God calls people that don't fit the spiritually attractive category that we have preset in our minds. We are not so-and-so. Identify your Eliab. Who is it? Who are you allowing yourself um, to elevate to the point because of how amazing they are for God, how much they love the Lord, that you're denigrating yourself down so that you don't obey and step out? Who is it? And allow the Lord to obliterate that because He's called you for such a time as this. He has a call for them, but you need to accept your anointing and follow Him. And then the second thing is this. We should align our hearts with the Lord, which means our heart operating in harmony with His heart, that our priorities become His priorities. When we do that, when we allow these presets of what we think a great Christian follower of Jesus Christ is supposed to be that we juxtapose ourselves with when we let that go and we just accept the fact that God has called us, then Opie leads Israel. Opie leads Israel. God has called you to step out. Don't denigrate who you are in light of Eliab. There was a family. They had a neighbor named Bud Villers. Family had two young boys in it. One was an early teenager that was in elementary school. And Bud was their neighbor. And Bud uh, was an amazing neighbor. And he would help their father uh, with projects around the house. If he was pouring concrete, he'd help him. If he was re-roofing, he'd help him. And their father would help Bud out. Bud's an older fella. And, and Bud would, uh, sometimes he would hire them to mow his lawn. And after they mowed the lawn, he would, he would give them a, a Coke and, and um, some pie. And, and sometimes Bud uh, would go fishing. And he, when he'd go fishing, he'd bring trout back. And at one point, the older one, the teenager, had a, a, a route, a paper route, and uh, he always got a really fat tip from Bud. Bud was always kind. Uh, Bud was always uh, friendly uh, and generous and caring. And Bud always invited the boys to vacation Bible school at his church. You see, every Sunday they watched Bud walk out with his Bible. Rain, shine, mattered not. He left every Sunday and went to worship. Bud didn't talk to the boys a lot about the Lord or anything, but he invited them to vacation Bible school. Well, the younger one finally decided to go, but the teenager was too cool for that. And so um, the teenager, I mean, the, the younger one went a few times, and after a while he, um, he began to change. And he came home with a Bible, and, and he kind of started reading the Bible privately. And this teenager watched his little brother change. But every time he was invited... His response was no. Well, at one point there was this college choir that had come through and had come to the local high school and the teenagers saw the college choir and thought there were some cute girls in the college choir and they had announced that they were going to be at a local church that evening and Bud walked over and said, hey, by the way, uh, a choir is going to be at our church this evening. Would y'all love to go? Of course, the teenager said, cute girls, I think I'll go. And that evening... That teenager met Jesus. Two boys following Jesus. And their major influence was a guy named Bud, who was an older fellow, who never held a, a high leadership position, was not immensely attractive, was not a, a, a figure in the town. As a matter of fact, um, the only thing he did was he was a very faithful usher in his church, and he invited people to church. 
It's a simple message, a simple, simple man, a nobody. But that nobody was somebody because the kingdom advanced. And Bud would have never led two people to the Lord if he had let his perception, his Eliab, give him the excuse to not fulfill his call. Beloved, who or what is your Eliab? Who or what do you think is bigger, more powerful, more spiritual than you? that will give you the excuse to keep from following and stepping out. I'm going to ask you to do something very risky. I'm going to ask you to let that image go and just say yes to Jesus. And then align your heart and watch what God does. David becomes the lineage for the Savior of the world. He is the most notable and amazing king in the entire history of Israel. But he was a nobody, a redhead, probably had multiple excuses because he didn't look like Eliab, but he reflected a heart that loved God. So, beloved, God's called us in this age to speak to the excuse of comparison, to let our Eliab go, and to just say yes to the anointing, and then align our hearts with His, and let's watch what happens. Let's pray. Lord, I'm in awe of how you do so many transformative things in people's lives. Lord, we are filled with excuses. But I pray that we would not self-condemn, Lord, but that we would identify and release. Lord, there are great, great men and women of God around us, spiritual giants, and I thank you for them. But Lord, may we never allow them to become our excuse for inactivity. So Lord, I pray we'd be like David. No names, unremarkable, except reflecting our love of you. And Lord, I pray that when we say yes, that we see kingdom effectiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, beloved, who is your excuse? Identify, speak to. Don't denigrate yourself. Accept your anointing. And see what God does. Opie led Israel, if you will. Didn't have to look like Eliab. Didn't have to look like one of the famous Chris's, Michael B. Jordan, any of those people. He was the one that God chose because of his heart. Align your heart. Destroy the images. Take your anointing. And let's watch the kingdom come. God bless you. We'll see you next week.